with that, doctor, we appreciate that. Thank you. We have uh, Lou is back for another question. Lou, go right ahead and unmute yourself, please. Uh, thanks. Dr. McDougall, uh, I've heard you talk about this. I, I have also, also seen a video by uh, Nathan Pritikin where you interviewed him address oh, okay. this. But I'd like to ask directly, what do you believe, in your opinion, what causes psoriatic arthritis and can the starch-based diet do anything to reverse that? Uh, well, Nathan Pritikin used to tell me, and he was one of my most important mentors, by the way. If you want to hear an interview I did with Nathan Pritikin, the only, it's the only interview that exists. The only video that exists was one that I took when I was a very young doctor. And you can uh, play that video in its entirety. If you go to my website, drmcdougall.com, and you go to the February 2013 newsletter, February 2013 newsletter, a whole interview with Nathan Pritikin. And uh, he used to tell me that uh, he'd never seen a case of psoriatic arthritis that didn't clear up with a healthy diet. Uh, Walter Kempner with the rice diet, he also reported people with psoriatic arthritis and psoriatic lesions. And he, he had the same results, you know, they, they cleared up. And that's been my experience too. Why? I don't know. I think Nathan Pritikin talks about microcirculation of the skin and the joints. It's an autoimmune disease, an autoimmune disease. And my May 2014 newsletter discusses autoimmune diseases in some detail and why it's animal proteins that incite these diseases. We're animals. When you eat foreign animals, like foreign thyroid glands, what happens is the body makes antibody to pig and cow thyroid. It's not you, it makes antibodies to them, but it's, it's enough you so that it attacks your own thyroid gland. So, so where do you eat cow and pig thyroid glands? Well, how do you eat those? Hot dogs, sausages. We, we, we waste nothing in the slaughterhouse. Everything goes into the sausages. <laughs> oh, anyway, that's how you get autoimmune diseases. That you, it's a process called molecular mimicry. And in the case of psoriasis, it's probably an attack in the blood vessels and the skin cells and the, and the joints. I mean, people with psoriatic skin lesions have a lot of arthritis. In fact, the arthritis is really fun to take care of because they get well so fast. Doctor, thank you for that. We have next uh, Elaine. Elaine, if you'd go ahead and uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, you are. You are. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McDougall, I have two quick questions. Right? One's more theoretical. The first is you mentioned MS. What do you think of the Terry Walls protocol for MS? Thumbs up, thumbs down. And the second question is, can you distinguish resistant starches from starches in general? and further distinguish those from insoluble, insoluble fiber. Thank you. Okay, I'm not an expert on Terry Walls, but from what I do remember she teaches the paleo diet and she's a study of one, that's herself. To date, I mean, maybe they should have done a study, but the research I'm talking about, which uses something very different than the paleo diet. I mean, we share in the fact that neither of us recommend dairy, but their diet is based on eating animals. You know, I have a real problem with eating animals, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it took me many years to develop that consciousness. So, uh, you know, like I say, she's a study of one. Swank has studies of 5,000. We've got studies of, uh, you know, well, less than 100. But anyway, uh, that's what I think about uh, using the paleo diet to treat MS, as Dr. Walls does. And uh, all the science behind what I recommend is on our website. You really, I mean, we have a treasure trove. We have 8,000 pages on our website. Treasure trove of information on uh, all kinds of problems, diseases, is a free, a free uh, 12 day program. You know, as I said, basically everything's free, not just this month, but next month and six months from now, it's gonna be free. Thank you for that, doctor. And uh, with that, we have now Peter up next. Peter, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Hi, Peter, just waiting for you to unmute. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to move the cursor. Um, yeah, Dr. McDougall, 
I've, I've dropped you a note earlier to say I think I'm alive now because of you and uh, Dr. Esselstein. But um, yeah, since uh, bypass surgery in 2015, I've lost about 60 pounds, got, an, got about another 40 to go. But um, one thing that ca that's come up since this, the surgery is some um, atrial fibrillation. And I couldn't find anything in your website or others about whether I can expect to dispose of that problem by sticking to the program. Right. No, you can't. Uh, you should not expect atrial fib to reverse itself. Atrial fibrillation, I believe, is due to small blood vessel disease of the heart muscle. You don't see it on an angiogram. You could do an angiogram, you know, where they stick the catheter in your heart arteries and you would see no blockages. It's the little tiny vessels. And uh, it's based on the fact that people who eat a high cholesterol, high fat diet have the ones that have atrial fib. Once you get it, it's usually permanent. There's ablation techniques, which again, you'd have to explore yourself. Nothing I'm that familiar with. Otherwise you stay in atrial fibrillation. It's not such a dangerous arrhythmia. It's not, doesn't, doesn't bother the function of anybody except for maybe athletes, if you lose that function and have atrial fib. Uh, there are a whole, a whole bunch of debates that come up as to whether or not you should take Cardioversion, I would say no. Uh, whether or not you should uh, use various kinds of drugs, I have a very limited number of drugs I use with atrial fib. They're digoxin and a beta blocker. And uh, whether or not you should put somebody on a blood thinning, uh, blood thinning drug like the new drugs, Eliquis, and the old drug, Coumadin. And uh, this is a big debate because these drugs cause you to bleed, they could kill you. And uh, you want to make sure that you really are a candidate where you, uh, you're more likely to have benefits and risks. And so my patients, and of course, anybody who comes to our clinic, by internet, you can't fly out and see us anymore, uh, is we make sure that they understand how to properly evaluate drug therapies. Our doctors are trained to do that. How to evaluate drug therapies <clears throat> and uh, decide whether or not taking one of these blood thinners, thinners will do you more harm than good. And in general, what it turns out, uh, like for example, when you use the CHAD score, C-H-A-D-S, the CHAD scoring method, it turns out that people are in good health. People who, by the way, follow our diet end up in this kind of characteristic good health. They should not be on these blood thinning medications. Only sick people are very likely to have strokes are to be on this kind of medication. So most of my patient medications don't even require based on legitimate, you know, standard doctor protocols. They don't require having blood thinners. Some do, but most don't. Hey, we're real doctors. We, we, don't, we don't do anything weird. We just take care of people by using standard medicine, the best medicine out there with the majority opinions backing it. Uh, why do something weird when just doing something normal is so dramatic? A good grief. You know, we've already met people who've lost 60 pounds on this show. You now we have people who lose 40, 50, 60, 100 pounds, and they've lost it for a lifetime, two or three or four or five decades. Uh, we have people who are getting off of all their insulin. In fact, most, most people with type 2 diabetes get off all their pills, off their insulin. We get well over 90% of people off all their diabetic medications. People throw away their antacids and their laxatives. Why? Very simple. <laughs> because it's the food they're suffering from food poisoning. It's the food that's making them sick. The food poisons are animal foods and oils. And if you switch to a starch-based diet, in other words, rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, pastas, breads, breads, the staff of life. When did bread become so evil? It's always been the staff of life. Excuse me, it's like somebody's uh, lying to you. Uh, once you switch to this kind of diet, then you get your health back. And you, you know, you, you don't solve problems like if you walk out in the middle of the street and get hit by a car, you still break your bones. But you don't get dietary diseases. You know, the common cancers, the constipation, the oily skin, the heart attacks. You, you know, you, these, these are diseases of rich foods. Diseases that were once, uh, once only available to kings and queens. Now everybody's so rich in the United States and China. 
China. You know, China before 1980, they had uh, a population where there were close to 2 billion people and they lived on a diet of white rice. 90% of their diet was white rice and essentially nobody was overweight and essentially nobody had type two diabetes. That was 1980. So what is this? This is uh, 40 years later. Now, now they have a population of people where they report at least 12% of the people are, are diabetic and half have pre-diabetes. Well, have you seen what's happened to China in the last 40 years? You know, gone from, you know, rather impoverished population living on rice and, you know, not really having all the advantages of Americans. And while well, they saw CNN news and they want to eat just like Americans and live just like Americans. And so China has the second highest number of Tesla supercharger stations in the world. Second only to the United States where we have a population of 14% are diabetic. So what's your conclusion? Tesla's cause diabetes. Thank That's you. A, that, was, that was a joke. <laughs>